Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today is hopefully going to be a great one for you. We're going to be going over the differential stress resistance hypothesis, why this is so important, especially in regards to cancer, not only hopefully preventing cancer to a degree, but certainly making it far more effective if one is treating cancer. So again, whenever I use the word treat or cancer, I have to give you the disclaimer that I'm not here to provide you with any medical advice, medical diagnosis, medical cures, or medical uh, intervention of any kind. But what I want to share with you is breakthrough research. So over the past, I would say for sure five years, but definitely honing in the last three years, I've been studying a lot about anti-aging. And the reason why I think that this is such a now important topic is that it was fringe for like, let's say 10 years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago. But now, not only do we have the research, but we have actually the science and the protocols to back it up. Plus, we have the biological age testing to see what is working. Okay, so while I was going through all of that research, there's a few things that really stood out to me. The first one, no doubt about it, is intermittent fasting. So that's a big one. But I do want to share with people that the biggest benefits from fasting come from longer fasts. They don't come from necessarily 16 hours overnight. And again, I'm not discrediting that because I myself and all those in my practice, we recommend 12 to 16 hours of an intermittent fast every single day on a daily basis. So there's no doubt about that. Even if it's just seven at night to seven in the morning, we definitely recommend 12 hours, ideally 14 hours or so for most people. Most people can do about six at night to eight o'clock in the morning. Not everybody, totally understand that, uh, but that seems to be really appropriate, at least in our private practice. What I want to share with you, though, is that the big developments in fasting are really in the two and three days, closer to three days. And the reason is, is that there's just far more autophagy that takes place, which is basically the cellular cleanup. But they found something that goes well beyond just cellular cleanup, like meaning like getting rid of a lot of the disease tissue, growing cancer cells, et cetera. Like that's super important. Don't get me wrong. But what they found is that the something interesting happens within the body at that essentially three day mark. And I've actually gone through a podcast that goes through 12 hours, 18 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, 72 hours. So I tell you all the different things that are happening in your body, like the depletion of white blood cells, et cetera. So what I'll do is I will link up that show on today's show, which is episode 2769. You'll be able to find all the show notes, the three big takeaways at Stephen cabral.com slash two seven six nine. We'll also link up all the previous intermittent fasting shows in case you are new to the topic or you want to get a little bit more advanced as well, no matter where you are in your research. All right. So I'm going to go over the differential stress resistance hypothesis Then I'm going to tell you what it all means in terms of like normal speak. All right, here we go. So the differential stress resistance hypothesis is a concept that originates from the realm of cancer biology and treatments, particularly in the context of therapies like fasting or caloric restriction. So differential stress hypothesis, resistance hypothesis is a hypothesis that posits that normal cells and cancer cells respond differently to stress. Under certain stress conditions, such as those induced by fasting or caloric restriction, normal cells enter a protective mode making them more resistant to stress. This is a protective adaptive response that potentially evolved over millennia as a way for cells to survive under nutrient scarce conditions. Cancer cells, on the other hand, are often characterized by uncontrolled growth and a constant need for nutrients to support this growth. Because of these characteristics, they do not respond to the same stressors in the same way as normal cells. Instead of entering a protective mode, they become even more vulnerable under certain conditions of stress like fasting. When this differential stress resistance is applied in the context of cancer treatment, it suggests that creating certain stress conditions like fasting prior to administering chemotherapy or radiation could protect normal cells from the harmful effects of treatment while making cancer cells more susceptible to it. Essentially, the treatment becomes more targeted towards the cancer cells, reducing collateral damage to healthy cells. All right. This to me, when I read that, was absolutely remarkable. And the reason is, like, whether you believe in using chemotherapy or radiation, that's honestly, it's not for me to decide for you. It's for you to decide for you if you do have cancer. What I'm saying, though, is when they did the research and they actually looked at fasting, 
just straight fasting, longer fasting, like a weak water fast, etc., or or a you know a true whole food functional uh, mimic or a fasting mimic diet. They show the results were basically like that of chemotherapy. They were, they are actually very impressive, and uh, and we know that chemotherapy is more palliative, meaning like uh, the success rate of curing cancer with chemotherapy is, is not great. It's really not. It's it's you know it's exaggerated in some studies and it's somewhere around like two to three percent. Now, what it does do though, is it can prolong the life of the individual. It can certainly reduce pain. And, and it, that's why we call it palliative, right? But if you have cancer, you want to get rid of the cancer, right? And so what they actually found is that you'll get double the results, literally double the results. And in the mice studies that they've done, because um, chemotherapy, unfortunately, has side effects, which is one of those can be death, unfortunately, as well, because it really wipes out your immune system. In the mice studies that they used fasting plus chemotherapy or cancer-based treatments, none of the, the one particular study, none of the mice died. And they got more than double the results. So that was, I just thought that that was absolutely remarkable. And now in human-based studies, they're starting to look at it. You can literally look this up on PubMed yourself. You can just type in um, fasting mimicking diet and chemotherapy or just fasting and chemotherapy treatments. And even the more advanced oncologists now, if the person's not too weak, because sometimes obviously if you've been doing cancer-based treatments for a while, you, you might be quite weak. You might not have a lot of uh, weight to be able to lose. But this is essentially, and again, I'm not giving you any medical advice, all right? I'm not telling you that this is a cure for cancer. I can't do that. But what I want to share with you is to give you your best, uh, your best hope, and, and not just hope, but an actual protocol. So I, this is not the only thing that you should do, by the way. Like, again, I've talked about it just in a couple other Friday reviews. Again, whether you're going natural treatment or you're doing conventional medicine or a blend of both. And again, I support people however they want me to help them support them, right? In a cancer-based support protocol. But I wouldn't recommend this as the only thing. However, here are the results. Fast, one to two days, water, maybe some herbal teas only for a day or two before chemotherapy. Let's say it's a one-day treatment, okay? Then you're fasting the day of the chemotherapy, and then you're fasting for one or two days after that. So it's a total of anywhere between three to five days, depending on how strong the body is and how uh, adaptive it is to being able to fast. But the fasting two days before, and they've actually shown this now for surgery as well, you'll repair that much faster. The cells, as we just read and you just heard, are going into a protective-based mode, the healthy cells. But the cancer cells can't. They, they are a fast-growing, they are an energy-consuming uh, pathogen in the body that needs the glucose. It needs the amino acids like glutamine. Um, and, and it can survive, honestly. Like, that's the thing people say, well, you know, you can just go on a no carb diet. I don't know. Like, to a degree, I've seen that work in like brain tumor studies. If you just go completely like zero carbs, um, I have. But other, other cancers, I have not seen that. I mean, especially like a pancreatic cancer and others, because actually, when the body goes into a state of autophagy with those types of cancers, the cancer cell actually has the ability to uh, have part of its cell die off, and then it actually eats that part of the cell during autophagy for energy, for life. So there are some that are definitely more challenging than others. There's no doubt about it. And that's why I would use these in conjunction with other protocols. But again, I don't say any of this to, you know, to, to give you false hope or to take away hope. I think that there is hope for everybody. The goal is to always find it early using a lot of the methodologies that I talk about in high performance health in the 10 mortality or vitality tests to actually find these things at stage one or earlier. That's obviously the goal using either blood work or full body scans or whatever you might you know want to do to be able to find this earlier, but then using the best of natural health. And if you choose to chemotherapy or conventional based methods to combine them together, again, as an integrative health practitioner, I am a, I am a board certified doctor of naturopathy. So I don't use any pharmaceuticals. I don't use any conventional method uh, or, or medicines, but that doesn't mean that I can't support someone who's going through some type of therapy where they want the best of all worlds. And I'll say, sure, here's how I can help you with those things. And, and that's what we do. And again, so the thing I think that a lot of health practitioners, if they've been in practice long enough, is that you do whatever is best for the patient or the client. You want to help them. It's their goal 
goals, not necessarily your methodologies, but how can you best help them? So I wanted to share this with you here today. As always, do feel free to share this show with anyone you believe it can serve. All the show notes will be at stephencabral.com slash 2769 for all of the details, the big takeaways, and again, the previous shows on intermittent fasting. Take care, everybody. Have an amazing day. I'll talk with you soon. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.